Yeah, that's going. God, how long ago is that? 2004. Jesus. <laughs> Nearly 20 years, Ron. Christ, where did the years go? <laughs> I know. It's like, and I remember the first time I saw, saw I, I was in 1993. So oh, really? Uh, uh, Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> Never heard of the band before that. Oh, really? So why did you go? Um, They said it was a prog fest. So I was like going, okay, I'll just go see bands that sound like, yeah. um, you know, prog. Yeah. You know, and, and the, and it was it was a great great uh, it was supposed to be a weekend. Yeah, it was like our first time in the states. It was uh, interesting because uh, the the main band provided the PA, and they were very, you know, I uh, we are sort of thing. And they said, well, "We you know we're going on last, and we're going to have uh, we're going to be um, the headline band." And uh, Lawrence Dyer, who's uh, one, was uh, still is IQ, who's wonderful sound engineer. A lot of stories about Lawrence. He said, uh, "He said, no, nope, we've got a contract. We're going on last. This is what's happening. We're playing for X amount of time." And uh, this guy from the the main band uh, kept going on at Lawrence. No, nope. he says, "Well, so if you don't like it, Lawrence says we won't play. Yeah, it's up to that. We got a contract. We won't play." And the bloke uh, says, "I'm not getting any cooperation here." And Lawrence, who's a big guy from London, and this guy wasn't very as tall. Lawrence just said. Right, let's get a few things straight. And I was just in, in awe. I thought, whoa, oh. this is the sort of people I want to be with. <laughs> All right. Yeah, because uh, I remember they told me, uh, well, I read in the paper it was supposed to be a two day festival, but then, you know, something happened and um, they just shrunk it down to one day. All right. And, and the only thing, uh, there was four bands on, on the day that you guys played. Yeah. You, a uh, Swedish band, Anglo yeah. and- yeah. Three Mellotrons, three Mellotrons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it's like, uh, the other two were, weren't memorable. Yeah. I, don't, I honestly don't remember those two. You know, they, um, I think one of them was called Quill. And well, that's right, yeah. It was. And, another, and I think another one was called Citadel or something like that. They were the guys that pro provided the PA, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and I and I remember, I think I kind of remember with them, it they had a lot of costume. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, all uh, when I got to uh, the theater. I, I I came with uh, one group of friends, and then another group of my friends were there, and uh, they were telling me, "Oh, Ron, you're gonna love this band." And I'm like, "Okay," and I said, and uh, I was further back; they were up front, so I was further back. I, I I think I was at the right place to get all the the sound, and um, and. And then I found out after that show that you guys played up in San Jose the, the next year or something like that. Oh, that's right, yes. yes and, we uh, did. and I didn't even hear about that. But if we had hearing that back then, I would have heard about it. Yeah. It's um, so funny now, isn't it? You know, uh, information is so readily available on what's going on. You only have to type it in. Whereas I can do it as it was much more difficult, wasn't it? Like, <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, and then you got you know this uh, Zoom that you can oh. talk to people all over the world. Yeah, um, bye everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, like I was telling you, you know, I saw you guys ninety three, and the next time was down in uh, Baja Prague in two thousand four. Yeah. And that's where the ambulance. <laughs> and then after that, the next time I saw you was in 2009 over at that Pittsburgh at 3RP Festival. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was, and good. That was good fun. And then the last time I saw IQ was in 2012 at Rossbath. Mm, after, after I left. Yeah. Yeah. That was the, la that was the last one that, uh, 
that I saw. And I mean, there was, I know you guys played a, a couple more times in the States afterwards. Mm. And, and then I got, I got something that you, a uh, band that you're also involved with, Frost. Yeah. That, that their box set, uh, 13 Winters. Yeah. Yeah, I got that. I got that locally. It was in the, it was in the shop here, you know, and, and I was like going, this is crazy. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't have to wait to, for it to arrive in the mail. It was just right there. Wow. Right on, wow. right on the shelf. <laughs> I, I literally had to double, do a double take because, you know, at that store, you normally don't find uh, frog there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's usually, I mean, except for like, you know, Kansas or, you know, uh, Genesis or Yes, you know, things like that. You, find, you know, those are pretty much at any shop. Mm-hmm. But um, the guy must have known you live locally, Ron, and that was he thought, he thought I've got a definite sale here. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, I, I get lucky every once in a while finding something. A, a, a gem over there and um but to find that kind of a thing that box set yeah yeah that was, that was insane you know and, <laughs> you know i was hoping you know now i'm hoping maybe more stuff you know well you never know if they find people are buying it they might be uh getting it in yeah I mean, but it's weird here in maine uh we're it's kind of really this kind of music, it's a wasteland because uh, the only kind of music that plays live here is the greatest hits tour. You know, bands that have, haven't put out an album in decades and they're just resting on their laurels playing their hits. Yeah. Or you get country bands, or you get rap bands. I mean, <laughs> you don't you, uh, you don't really get that many modern rock bands. You know unless they're charting on, you know, but. Well, it's a difficult scene, isn't it? You know, um, promoters are playing it safe. You know, if you, if you get uh, those, the sorts of bands that you've mentioned, you know, you're going to get an audience, you know, uh, and I don't know what it's like over there, but the, the live scene's changed as well uh, over, over here. And, and, you know, particularly uh, prog music, it's always had a, uh, you know, a, a very precise audience, a big audience, but it's getting to it, you know, and, uh, and like playing Europe, there's a series of venues you can depend on, or in Britain, there's a series of venues you can depend on. Uh, but when I first started out in ARC, you know, we used to play 70 gigs a year, quite happily. And, and our, our, our ambition was to get a gig in Birmingham, which is like the second biggest city in, in, the, in, 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 in England, certainly. And the only way we got it was a competition. Uh, it, it was, you know, enter this competition, and if you win the competition, you get a day's uh, recording. And so uh, we entered it, and, you know, Ark were a good live band. They got a good show and funny uh, and engaging. Tony Short, the singer, was brilliant. You know, he could really grab an audience. And, and and we won the competition. So we got the recording, but we also got this opening. And from there, we got to play the marquee, you know, it started getting uh, noticed. And then the band decided they wanted to be Guns N' Roses. <laughs> you know, it's like throwing away your audience. Your audience likes what you do. They don't right. like something else. So that was when I left them. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes people make... Uh... Inter- you know, interesting choices as to what they want to do. And um, when I was when I was talking to uh, the guy, the guys in Palace, they, you know, kind of came to the conclusion that it was probably, they, looking back, they said it was probably better that we shouldn't have gone with EMI. We should have just stayed, you know, independent. Because, you know, big record labels, tend to uh, promise young young stars uh, uh, things that they can, you know they're not going to deliver on and yeah. and now and nowadays it's like you know we, a majority of the programs are are releasing things on their own independently 
Mm -hmm. And then they may have a label like, let's say, Inside Out Music that maybe distributes them or something. Mm -hmm. You know, with and you know, I think Inside Out was like a was the perfect uh, label to get into. Odd, you know. Yeah, I, and that very much came out of the whole IQ thing. You know, Thomas Varba was a huge IQ fan, and Michael Schmitz, who he sets up the label with. Two of them, you know, I, I think um, first gig I ever played with ARC supporting IQ, uh, uh, they were there, you know, uh, and uh, they came over for those dates, which was uh, um, Are You Sitting Comfortably? IQ did a handful of dates in the UK. and you know, outside of London, their audience wasn't that big. So they actually got ARC as a support band, you know, uh, I was told later, because we had that following in the provinces. And, and you know, they were help, having it would help boost the audience. And, and, you know, I think it did okay. And certainly that's how I met everybody and um, got on with people and, and got the chance to play with one of my favourite bands ever for 20 years, which was a fantastic experience. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean that 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 alone right there. With, you got to play with your favorite band. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, you can't really beat that experience there. Uh, yeah, um, are you, and, and uh, you know, it, it's good to have a range of experiences. IQ have done it right, you know, in that they they had to deal with Polydor, uh, lost that, and then it was a case of oh, what we're going to do now. And then they released uh, J. Palette Darnu, which is a compilation of some live tracks and some rarities to help establish GEP. And GEP has gone from strength to strength now. You know, there's two words in music business, and so often people just think of the first one. Uh, and IQ have really got good at, at, at both parts of, of that phrase. Right. Yeah, I have, I have that. I, I mean, I had the one <clears throat> um, a few years back that they re released the first two albums in as a deluxe package, and they did uh, Ever mm. as a deluxe package. And um, you can hear the difference between the original recording and the, the, the remix and remaster of it. And, I mean, it's really weird, you know, because I was such a huge IQ fan before I joined, and that came out of ARC. Uh, someone came up to me at an ARC gig and said, oh, you remind me of IQ. Uh, and I said, I've never heard of them. Because I wasn't into, you know, I was, I was a 70s prog kid. Uh, first album was Pictures and Exhibition, then got into Yes, and Yes was my big love, and Chris Squire was the reason why I, I played bass. Um, uh, and then I fell out of it, and there's loads of other things going on. I really got into um, the, uh, the new wave after punk, you know, bands like Magazine and, and Skids and Simple Minds at the time. Uh, and then the opportunity came along to join ARC, because I've been playing with uh, Angie Bowie, uh, David Bowie's ex-wife. Uh, I, I was in her band uh, through a series of contacts. And she came up to Birmingham to um, rehearse with us at a studio in, in uh, Birmingham called Rich Beach. Uh, and of course, they got a load of publicity out of this. And they were really chuffed to bits, really, really pleased with it. Uh, and so I had a phone call from Lynn, who was one of the owners of the place, who said, you know, um, this band here looking for a, a bass player. And we thought of you. Uh, and that was... was uh, arc so you know the opportunity to join arc and then uh, get back into this sort of music but it, it it was it was lively it was funny it was exciting it wasn't about goblins and gremlins and things like that right um, and then when we uh, uh somebody said you know um you know you should listen to iq and i said okay I'll, you know somebody said this before i said what album should i buy and they said buy the wake okay i'll buy it i'll buy it so i went down a local store, bought the wake, stuck it on a tape. And every day when I went to work, I had this tape on and I just fell in love. I absolutely fell in love with the band. And it, it was the fact that, uh, as Peter Nichols has said, uh, I read in an interview not so long back, you know, it, it was it was about what's happening inside. It wasn't about, you know, fantasy and, and so right. and forth. You know, there was actually sex in the lyrics, sex in a, a, a prog 
that song, you know, what, what, what? I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> and it was it was powerful and it grabbed you. Uh, and so, you know, when we found out we were sporting IQ, I couldn't, I was so over the moon. Uh, and, and, you know, then the opportunity came. I remember saying to uh, Adam Fox, Mike's sister, you know, if the opportunity came, I'd love to play with, with IQ. It would be a dream come true. And uh, yeah, they got in touch. But the funny thing with the the um, the audition was a precursor of things to come because Cookie, uh, Pete, Paul Cook, the, the, the drummer, couldn't make it to the audition. So the audition was with Steve Christie from Jadis on drums. <laughs> And I don't think they told me I was actually a member of the band until about 15 years later. I just kept turning up. <laughs> Probably like, uh, hey, why is that guy keep on showing up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, um, ever since, you know, Prague Fest in 93 in Los Angeles, uh, I'd been, I was gathering, you know, uh, the different albums that were available at the time. Um, it was a record, a tiny record store down in uh, Redondo Beach, which was about, I want to say about an hour away from the from LA. Mm -hmm. And this guy had, it looked like it could have been like a tiny house. Mm -hmm. And he, he would um, play the stuff over his speakers. And if any of the CDs were open, he said, you know, you want to listen to it? We'll play it. And uh, I got, uh, I mean, all the all the albums up to, to ever from from that guy because he had them local. Yeah. And and then when you guys went, uh, got on to, I guess, with Inside Out Music, uh, and you know, then when they re released the album, it was like, uh, ever, ever, you know, the deluxe one. Ah, yes, ah, yes, nice big, like, old album. Oh, my gee, it was kind of, <laughs> oh, it's just a. For, for honestly, for an independent band to do this kind of packaging, and like I was saying, that kind of packaging, mm -hmm. it's just amazing, you know. Well, you know, GP is a good sized company now, it's very, very well run. Uh, and you know, with Rain, uh, when we got uh, the offer to sign to GP, I thought that's brilliant because you know, I respect Mike Holmes very much, and you uh, uh, and Peter Hooth and, and Rob and the guys there. Uh, with GEP and for them to say we really like what you're doing I mean Mike dropped me a line and said it, it, it's not the sort of stuff we normally release and that's a good thing it, it's prime right. but it, it's not you know what you would expect uh, uh, and you know uh, the rain album I'm chuffed with it I think it's the best thing I've ever done well, what, with well with you know when I listen to the to the three songs on YouTube and it's like of your other bands that you've been in, you know, that I, that I know of, I never heard anything from art. So I don't, uh, but, you know, with Arena, IQ, Frost, uh, Jadis, I mean, I hear bits of it, you know, it, it's such the DNA of, of what you're doing, you know, as Rain. And you can hear that, but then at the same time, it's completely original <laughs> sounding. It doesn't, um, it is almost like, you know, you guys are doing prog, but you're doing it by, in your term, not what is expected of you. Well, it's, it's funny you should say that. I mean, I think there's two, two, two points that from, from my own view. Um, you know, I don't come at it from a view of this is what a prog bass player should play. Uh, I, I come at playing bass because I like particular bass players. You know, my, my favourite, uh, uh, the root of what I, I do, I think, is the sort of Motown style. I love, you know, uh, Jameson. And if you listen to something like uh, I Was Made to Love Her by Stevie Wonder, 
you know, that bass line on it. Do 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 it's 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 a melody in itself. And it's you know, put a melody across in the bass. And then the other thing I like is funk and rhythm. I was thinking about this the other day. Um somebody uh, said, oh, they're trying too hard. You know, we've had generally really, really good reviews for the Rain album, but some people either love or hate the last track, which is a bit ambient. And, and there was one German review which said, oh, they've obviously been listening to loads of modern prog. And, and I was thinking, Do you know, I haven't consciously, I've consciously not listened to any modern prog since we played with Spock's Beard. And the reason for that is Dave Miros, is a wonderful bass player. It's fantastic. I remember watching Spocks, and his, I, I don't know the name of the song. You'll I'll sing it, and if you can uh, uh, work out what I'm singing, you probably oh, it's so and so. There was one bass line that Dave did, was, do, 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 and I, I, I thought that's fantastic. And that was the last time I listened to any other modern prog band because I thought I'm just going to copy all that stuff. You know, and I don't right. want to do that. So one day, you know, when, when, when all of this is done, when all of these are sold, I'll sit down and listen to loads of great music. But I don't want to do it now because I don't want that. So, so like the music I listen to at the moment, particularly, is a lot of dancey stuff. You know, uh, Alex, my partner, we met about five years ago and she loves house music and techno. And, you know, you say that to him, you go, <laughs> But the rhythm and the feel and the way it works. And if you can put that into, why can't you put that into a prog track in what you do? So what I try and do is that rhythm and the melody. And I think there are parts of the Rain album, particularly something like Magician, which are really funky, really, really funky. And they work in the context of the song. And why not? You know, there's no reason why any type of music can't be arranged in a progressive manner. And to me, that's what progressive music is. It's not goblins and dragons and whatever. It's the way you arrange a track to make it interesting and make it work. Uh, and uh, I read something Neil Peart said where he said, you know, if, if you don't see the way it's made, that's the key. You know, if, if you just enjoy what it is and if it's doing 5-8 or whatever and it feels natural, that's brilliant. That's great. Exactly. You know, um, back in 1997 at, at Progfest when John Wetton played and uh, Martin Orford, he was, you know, did the keyboards. Yeah. After that, that night, um, I, I think it was like two o'clock in the morning across the street, there was that little, uh, little hotel and saw Martin just walking around and I just, you know, I went up to him, you know, introduced myself and we talked, I think, almost till the sun came up. And um, one of the things that we talked about, you know, at that time, all I thought is, okay, you know, uh, prog band, they have to put out a 20 minute <laughs> all the time, yeah. you know, and I was talking with him and he changed, changed my thinking he says, if the song gets to 20 minutes, fine, but we're not, that we're not, that's not our goal. The goal is to make the song. And that, he said, it could be five minutes, 10, 15, you know, et cetera. It's, it's just, uh, and it seems like there are still bands out there that they, they even like go, I, we did our, um, we have our prog credentials because we put a 20 minute or a 25 minute song and it's like sometimes they set those epic sound really good other times you can tell where they're piecing in different things and that have nothing really to do with each other but you know we're going to make an epic mm -hmm. and um and i i honestly i find uh, quite a bit of songs especially like in the iq catalog um, that short, short one here on the first album. Um, it was like two and a half minutes. And um, uh, too small of writing, but it was two and a half, it was two and a half minutes, but it was like in that two and a half minutes, a lot of things were happening, you know, <laughs> and it's like, it was the most, for me, you know, it was the most complex thing I heard in 
that short of a time span. So it's like that, that, you know, after I got into listening to that song, I understood what Martin was saying that, you know, it doesn't matter the length, it just matters what the content. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, mean yeah. I used to love, sorry, sorry. It's kind of, kind of, I guess you would say quality over quantity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, um, one of my favourite long pieces when I was uh, much younger was uh, The Icon by Todd Rundgren. Yes. Uh, and, you know, that's one of those tracks that it just, it, it, I mean, it's over 20 minutes long, but you, I play and it doesn't feel that long. It doesn't feel no, that no. sort of length. Um, Million Town was like that. You know, playing it, playing it live, it, it never felt like a long track. But you sometimes get that with albums. When we, we went out uh, with The Visitor with Arena and did a six week tour and we played the album from start to finish. And, you know, that's one of my favourite albums that I've, I've been on. And that, you know, the, 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 that's a 40 minute piece if you play the full thing. And that never felt that long. It was more than 40 minutes. You know, it, it just flew because it worked. Right. And that's the thing, you know, you can have a short song that you think, oh, God, not this one again. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I mean, another band that I, you know, I saw at Progress in 94, uh, years later, they put out, you know, I'm going to show Echo in. Yeah. It's one track, 48 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but once you play it, goes by in a flat in a flash yeah. and it feels like it was maybe a six minute song and at the end it was like going oh wait where, is there more to this you know and it was just like this perfect way like you were saying it just absolutely worked i mean I think, fair enough but if you go into a gig and somebody's going to play a 48 minute song i'd want to know five minutes before so i could get a beer and or go to the loo or something right <laughs> exactly i mean <laughs> But you know, it's like I don't know if they they went in with the idea of doing it as one track, or um, I don't know if it would have worked if they you know cut it up into like sections. You know, instead of one track, you have many tracks. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes uh, bands do that. You know, they. Um, I mean, it's difficult when you've got a track of that length. You know, if, if you go out uh, as a, a van and you've got one 48 minute track, <laughs> then that's, you know, a big chunk of your set. Uh, exactly. Uh, you know, it does limit your options somewhat. I, I, I think that the key is the quality. If it works, it works. You know, it doesn't matter how long it is. And some the songs, good songs, kind of write themselves. And it was really, really interesting because uh, obviously I left IQ in yeah, 2010, I think it was. And 2019, I got asked back with a week's notice to do one show in Lorelei. Tim wasn't very well, he was taken to hospital. And so I got a call from Mike on the Friday saying, you know, that they're going to be out there uh, in, in Germany the following Friday. It's big open air festival. Would I do it? I said, yeah, of course I will. And I was playing on the Saturday with Tim Boness as well. So I was there anyway. Uh, and so I had a, a, a week to pick up songs. And, and, you know, leaving a band that you love is like leaving a girlfriend. You know, you, you don't want anything to do with them. So I hadn't listened to any IQ, hadn't heard the new material at all. You know, great. You get on with your life. I'm going to get on with mine, do what I do. Um, and, but I had to learn some songs from the Road of Bones to, to do. I learned three songs, I think it was. And I had to pick up the songs I was doing uh, and I had to rehearse with Tim as well. So I had all this going on at the same time. But it was really weird because I said to Mike uh, uh, after the show, you know, it went really well, I think. I think so. Yeah, uh, nobody left. Uh, 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 and I said to Mike afterwards, it was really weird with those songs that I had never heard before. I kind of knew how they were going to go because I was so used to, the, you know, I'd written with IQ, I'd been there for 20 years. And so starting to play them, it was very logical to play along with them. And, and you know, literally I, I had one rehearsal with the band where we went through uh, everything we're doing and I, uh, maybe three or four goes on my own to get this up. 
and it was fine <laughs> because it, it, I knew what it was going to do and it, it worked to me, you know, it, and it's that thing with music, you know, and of course it's different for everybody, but if you've got a large number of people that think, yeah, that piece of music works, then you've got an audience. Yeah, one of my favorite ones uh, when you were with them is uh, Subterranean. Um, I even uh, think a few years back they did, did that movie. Oh, yes, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I bought the movie so I can see if, how, and it was, the, I think the movie was a little different than what was going on with the storyline, but, you know, it's always hard to, like, uh, when you make a movie, a piece of music or a book, you're not, you know, you get close. Sometimes you're lucky and get it right on. But I mean, it was good. I mean, I I told people, you know, and you know, friends that love that love IQ. I said, you know, you should really pick this up. Hmm. And uh, Mike uh, sent me the the soundtrack. To it. All right. And it was just kind of how it was. You heard the subterranean of the album in it, but in almost different contexts, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For me. yeah I went along to the, uh, um, the premiere of the uh, uh, album as well. Uh, I was in the audience, uh, you know, and bought my ticket. <laughs> and Mike and uh, uh, Pete were there uh, answering questions. And it's funny because I watched the film. And, you know, I, I wrote some of the music on that album uh, and uh, I don't know what the album's about. And I watched the film and I still don't know what the album's about. Right. <laughs> That's OK. It, it means different things to different people. Music does, doesn't it? Everybody's got right. that interpretation. <laughs> I think that's that's the best thing is where you leave it up to the audience to interpret it as, you know, I mean, the person that wrote it knows what it's about, but then, no, don't. you know, <laughs> you know, you know, then, well, hopefully they, they should know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, but probably Pete knows better than anybody because it's the lyrics that tell the story. But no, I can't get my head around it. But, you know, it's a great, great piece of music. And, and uh, it was one, it was an opportunity uh, with Subterranean to really be able to get some of my ideas into the writing. You know, I think that reached a, 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 a real peak for me with IQ with Seventh House. You know, I, I got re really big chunks of songs on that. Yeah. And I was really, really proud of some of that stuff. You know, uh, um, and, and it, it's, you know, IQ, one of those bands that never stands still. The music is always changing and evolving. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I, from what I know, getting better. <laughs> well, you, well, I what I noticed, the difference between um, the old IQ, and then when uh, Peter left and Paul came in, uh, how that was a different sound. I mean, it's still you. It was IQ, but it was just a different version of it. And then when uh, when you joined uh, Ever, um, that marked a, a newer beginning. Uh, it was like completely modern, you know, and. But then when uh, Subterranean came out, it was like, it went from, just jumped way up. And, and I noticed there was almost like heavier elements to the, to the songs and, um, and even to uh, Peter's vocal uh, delivery, it's, it just had, had a little more uh, angst to it. <laughs> you know, and I'm, oh, I'm sure, <laughs> I, I think I think it had to do with the what the story was about. You know, it. Yeah. Uh, no, no and, it's, uh, sorry, you're saying. And um, you know, and, and seeing that seeing it uh, live was was right there was a treat. I, I don't know if I saw it all the way through. If you guys did it in. Uh, in 2004 down in, in at Baja Prague, I think I think you probably did. I, I can't remember. I think we probably paid a big chunk of it. I mean, um, the thing with uh, Subterranea is it was a big show. I think IQ brought it out to uh, to, to the States 
after I left. But <laughs> the first time we played it was uh, uh, properly with Shepherd's Bush Empire, which is, you know, a big venue of 2000, I think it is. Uh, somebody will tell me I'm wrong. And, uh, you know, the first time we'd used all of the equipment, we had a, a screen at the front of the stage uh, and, and uh, you could project onto it or project through it according to how you set the lights and everything. And so we start the, the, the gig with, with the, for the overture with the, the um, screen down on the first show. Uh, and um, then <laughs> uh, when, when, uh, Pete Stoon is, are oh, you inside? But, you know, the light shines through the screen. You can see him on a podium singing. And then subterranean, the track starts, you know, playing the, the funky bass line. And as the screen rises up, nobody realised that my bass pedals were actually looped over the screen. And so as the screen went up, my bass pedals went up into the air with it. Oh my. <laughs> it was proper spinal tap. That's <laughs> right, right. I can't play them. <laughs> I think probably almost every band has a spinal tap moment <laughs> oh, yeah. you know um what was it when i was talking with the guys at palace they told me this that there was quite a few times where they had a 20 minute delay and their for their set and uh, uh i think it was at the time with their first singer uh ewan um uh, so i'm sure he probably went out there and entertained you know but it's like, uh, I think that's where a lot of, because, you know, prog music is complex. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some, you know, maybe not, not always the plane, but, you know, the arrangement of the song and things can go wrong. So, you know, the lead singer has to go up front and, you know, maybe tell, tell some story. And, you know, um, yeah. uh, and then I, I also remember too, is back when I, with IQ, I started listening to him in 93 and I was in contact with, uh, with Martin over the fax machine. <laughs> and I was like, going, we were going faxing back and forth. And um, I tried and failed to do a, uh, a fan magazine. I just, um, just couldn't do it it was just uh me you know you know we're waiting for the facts i mean nowadays it's probably easier to do a fan club because you get you get in information almost instantly you know you ask hey you got this you know and there's they, almost less need for it isn't there that's the thing yeah but it was like i tried to do it and it failed and then you know i contacted martin and i just said it's I wasn't getting enough um, in the United States. I wasn't getting enough uh, interest to it. You know, I, I, and I didn't really, at that time, I didn't really know where to advertise, you know, an IQ fan club magazine. And, you know, where, where back then do you advertise? Well, so it's like I uh, contacted him. I, I even still have the, um, the first issue as it was, you know, in pieces, you know, how I had to, was trying to put it together, you know, nowadays you can easily just do everything on your computer. But back then I was, you know, had the glue stick, you know, gluing in uh, the pictures and then uh, uh, the, t you know, the print and everything. And then to go take it to the printer, you know, it was just, it was a lot of work, and but I didn't have enough interest, so mm -hmm. I just decided, okay, you know, it's not happening. You know, I'm sure someone down the line probably did something, you know, especially since the internet came along, you know, mm -hmm. made things a lot easier to do. Yeah. So it's like, uh, you know, just doing that over the fax machine was was hilarious, and then one, I think mm -hmm. one time I actually called over there uh and um at the time i think martin and peter were in the in the office and and i talked with them for a while so it was kind of it was kind of interesting to you know here's a band that i love and then i got to 
fuck with two two of the guys from the band. Mm-hmm. You know, so when I met Martin in '97 after the the festival show, and then I met I met you in 2004 after the show, mm-hmm. um, out outside, and I just still trying to figure out why there was an ambulance at a frog festival. Like, you know, were, they, were they thinking something was going to happen? Are we all screaming fans or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or someone, someone fainted. <laughs> and and when uh, at 3RP 2009, uh, I remember I talked a little bit with Mike and a little bit with Peter. Uh, in that little, uh, in that hotel, you know, they had like that little um, conference room where all the bands came, you know, get a meet and greet type of a thing. Uh-huh. And, um, but when when I saw him in 2012, it, I, didn't, I didn't get to see any of, you know, after the show. You know? Really? <laughs> I don't know if they did any, if they came, you know, because they have that, uh, Ross Betts had the you know after hours show, and I don't know if maybe the the guys were too tired from you know playing that night. <laughs> That's the whole point of doing gigs is to be able to get out and have a few beers afterwards. But back in uh, I think it was was it 2007, uh, Peter went down with uh, um, uh, some problem. He couldn't sing, and we had a gig the following uh, week in Germany. And, and Mike said, Pete can't do the gig. Can you sing it? And I said, okay. <laughs> always say yes. So uh, I, I went home after we, we rehearsed the week. We always used to re- rehearse the weekend before. We went home and I spent the week going through the songs and making sure of the parts I could do. A couple of songs I got Mark Westwood, my roadie, to uh, play the bass while I sang. And I didn't drink, and I didn't drink coffee or tea, and I was a pure living boy for the entire uh, week. And we got to uh, the gig, and it was sold out, and they announced that Peter couldn't do it, but the gig would be going ahead. And I, I think, you know, a couple of people might have left when they realised I was on vocal duties, but, you know, it was a good crowd, and people were sort of going, OK, well, let's see what's going to happen here. So we did the gig and it went really well. It was good fun. And, and, and I remember Mike coming up to me. Uh, and I actually said to the crowd, he said, I'm really proud of this band that we pulled it off. We did it. We made it happen. And that night I got horribly, horribly drunk. And if you can imagine, I, you know, I hadn't drunk all week. Uh, I've been singing for the best part of two and a half hours. I couldn't speak for three days. <laughs> Just totally fell off. So it's a good thing we didn't have a gig the day after. <laughs> that must be, you know, that must be, I mean, you're up, you're up there on the stage playing your bass. I mean, that's one thing to, to get, um, you know, after years of playing that you get that, that, you know, that initial stage right when at the beginning, but then now to step away from your instrument of choice and you're put up right in the front and you're singing the songs, I could couldn't imagine what you know going inside your head like going you know are they going to kill me if i do it wrong <laughs> I, I you know it's it's never worried me i've never had stage from i love being on stage you know um and, and it was such fun to be able to do it you know what's what the thing is if you record a, a, an album the parts that you record are there forever and you know, you, 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 I guarantee that most people look back on what they did, and unless they're very self-forgiving, they're looking at me. Oh, we should have played that now. I could have done that. Yeah. The thing with the gig is, you can do that. You can make those changes. You can make that fly. And on the night when it works, it's fantastic. It is the best feeling you ever get. Somebody was saying the other day, uh, you know, you, you almost sense like a fugue state where everybody, including the room, is almost in this space. And so um, uh, after I left IQ, I did some shows with Uriah Heap. uh, And I I had three weeks notice. Mick Box phoned me up and said, uh, you know, uh, 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 the bass player is really ill. Uh, We need someone to stand in. You've been recommended. Uh, And I said, oh, Mick, uh, that's really kind. Um, I've I've got to make an admission. I've never heard any Uriah Heap. Can I have a listen over the weekend and come back to you? 
and he said, John, it's like this. I won't try and do his London accent. It's <laughs> like this. He said, we're playing Tel Aviv in three weeks. I said, Mick, I'll do it. And so, you know, three weeks, never from going from never hearing any Uriah Heat music to playing a full set, one rehearsal, sold out in Tel Aviv. It was fantastic. You know, I, could, you know, it, I didn't feel scared. I just felt so... You know, how many people would give a part of their body to be able to do that? You know, I've been so fortunate in my life. I've played with some of the bands that I love, you know, IQ, Arena, Frost, uh, uh, Rain now, uh, and so, so many more. Jadis was brilliant fun. And, and you know, and you, you're having a good time and people are having a good time. There's no better job. I hate it when you see a band and they look miserable on stage. You think, right. why are you doing this? Why are you up there? And then the band that taught me that was uh, Level 42. Now, I went and saw Level 42 in, oh God, 80 something, you know, when they were at their peak. And they were just having such a great time. And because they were having a great time, the audience was having a great time. <laughs> and so, and so I thought, that, well, well, you know, if you're up there and you're not having a great time, why are you doing it? So, so yeah, that's the way I always approach it. Why, you know, if you're scared, why are you doing it? I'm not scared. I love it. I love it deeply. Well, so, you know, I was, I always, <laughs> I always liked um, bands that have a little energy, you know. They don't have to like go full theatrical, but you know, just a little energy where, you know, the drummers getting into it, the guitar player, you know, when they go into their solo, you know, they get into that uh, that space, yeah. you know, that you know, a kind of a transcend, you know, thing, and then the bass player gets into that groove, that groove, you know, does it? You know, it doesn't really matter what the genre is. You know, you can tell when they get into it, and they move. They move with the music, and because uh, I've seen a few bands where they just stand still on the stage uh, and, and no energy is coming off of them. You mm -hmm. know, and and it gets. And I'm like going, you know. I may like this band's music, but their live presentation, uh, I just, I wasted my money for this because I could have just gone home. I could have just stayed home, listened to their CD. Absolutely right. I mean, I, you know, or the, or the bands that play their songs note for note, you know, how it sounded on the CD, they're playing exactly live. And it's like, it's missed. It, no, to me it's no fun i like it when uh, especially you know let's say you in a song there was a piece that you really wanted to be in it but you recorded the song and it's now you know set in stone right there but live you go oh well i wanted to do this thing let i want to try it out and see how it works mm. you know and you kind of you know sometimes that makes you know some shorter songs a little longer, you know, you know, so be it. But it's like, I don't want to hear note for note, you know, interpretations. You know, I want to hear, I want to hear something where it's very loose. I mean, you hear the song, but, you know, the band can go different directions. Absolutely you're right. When I first joined IQ, as I say, I'd spent uh, the previous three years doing 70 gigs a night. In, in IQ, we were playing tiny places. We, we, you know, we we would play uh, uh, a gig two or three nights a week. We would then rehearse probably three nights a week, and the other night we would play football together. It was it was a, it was a mission, you know. And we used to have to go out. I remember going to Hull, which is a small town on uh, 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 the uh, uh, west coast of the country, on a Wednesday night to play to thirteen people. And we gave a show, and you know, you gave a show. And so when I joined IQ, that's what I was used to doing. And our first gig was at the Marquee. And I remember <laughs> reading a, a review in a, 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 a fanzine called The Organ uh, that's afterwards, saying, oh, the new bass player, 
obviously doesn't get it. You know, he moves around much too much. <laughs> and I'm, you know, you see, we, we first played with uh, Jadis in the States. Uh, uh, I think it was the first Ross Fest. Um, I was jumping up and down, as you do, bouncing around. And I got a, a shout from the side of the stage. There's a problem. The stage isn't stable. It's collapsing. Stop jumping. So I jumped more. I jumped more. Because can you imagine if the stage had collapsed while we were on it? It would have been fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another spinal tap kind of moment, you know. Those are the things that people remember, not the gigs where, you know what, everybody played perfectly. You don't remember those gigs. You remember the gigs where something happened. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes, you know, sometimes something uh, magical happens, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, but it's like, that's, uh, unfortunately, you know, 2012 was also the the last year that I seen live music. It's uh, you know financially, you know, because no band comes up to Maine. I think the closest is uh, in Massachusetts, and not so much. But then it's weird. You have uh, the north of us, and you know, got Toronto and uh, Montreal that things are happening it's like you know it's like we're right in the middle of of the two you know yeah. things and it's like um so it's like i missed the remainder of the ross fests um and then now ross fest is down further for me down in florida so it's like <laughs> I'm, at, I'm at one tip of the, the coast and they're at the other tip you know <laughs> it's like I mean, you couldn't be more further apart. Uh, <laughs> but they, you know, I, these things are special. They, you know, the the the, the whole uh, thing. I mean, it's been ages since I played a gig in the states. You know, um, but they were such fun. Uh, I still hear from people. You know, um, um, Mark Kruger is a good friend, and to hear uh, obviously. From people about the passing of Norm Mead, yeah, poor old Norm. I got in touch with him uh, just to say hi and I hope you're doing okay and, and stuff. And I did hear back from him and I sent him a, a copy of the Rain CD and I sent him a t shirt actually. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and it, what, what we have here is so sure, you know, being on this planet, we're so lucky, but so sure. I don't believe in an afterlife. I believe that what's important is what we have now and you have to live this life. And, you know, uh, I, I used to love at, at uh, Rosfest and stuff, breakfast, going and sitting at people's tables. Right. People I didn't know and just going and, and saying hello and chatting to people because it's those connections, you know, we're so privileged, so lucky to be in a band and be able to do that sort of stuff and, and, and meet people. You know, uh, uh, Louis, uh, 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 NASA, uh, 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 people, uh, uh, Joel Klein, and loads of people I, I met, you know, uh, uh, over the year. Great people that are still there. Uh, uh, I know Lewis is putting together a uh, a uh, an album for uh, in memory of Norm and Rainer contributing a track right. to that. So you know, it's great to be able to be asked to do that thing, to have that connection with people, and still to be asked. So yeah, it's, it is a privilege. And so many people take it for granted or whatever. No, it's, we're really lucky, really lucky. Well, you know, also too, is like with the, you know, the after parties, uh, the Progress 93, I don't think there was anything. Um, Aha Prague, I think there was more of a select thing. Uh, I did see a couple of people, you know, yourse yourself, um, I, I have Probably. a picture. I have a picture of uh, another band that would play their uh, anecdote. Oh yeah, yeah. I have a picture of me sitting down, you know, on one of those couches they had in the lobby, you know, with with the guy, with the band, and um, and I don't think if it was a rock, you know, rock concert, you know, it would they wouldn't have that, you know, if there was a meet and greet, they would. You know, be charging you hundreds of dollars, and you get like a split second of you know, hello, you know, and you know, move side, you know, next. But with with the prog audience, you know, they connect with the band, and it's like, even though 
you don't see each other for maybe many years, you think of we think of each other as, as friends, you know, okay. you know, long distance friends, but still friends, you know. It's like if you if you met, uh, you know, there was a gig and there were people there, it would be as if no time had passed. But having said that, I think those after parties are a bit like the 60s. If you can remember the after parties, you weren't there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I got to tell you the thing is, I, I do remember I was there. Uh, <laughs> I've never I've never been a, a drinker or any recreational drugs or smoking or anything like that. I just, it just, um, not because, you know, I'm, you know, how do you say, goody two shoes. It's just, it just never appealed to me, mm. you know, and, uh, but the drinking and smoking, uh, my brother took that out. <laughs> <laughs> I think he made up for me not doing it. And because I remember when I turned 18, he says, I want to get, you should get drunk. And I go, no, I don't want to. And I turn, <laughs> when I turned 21, Oh, come on. This is the big year. You know, no, don't want to. Wow. The last time he tried is when I turned 25. After that, he, he just gave up. <laughs> I just had, I had no interest in it. And, and I, and I, you know, it's like, I don't care if someone else does it, you know, go ahead. That's fine. It's like, that's what, what you want to do. You know, it's like, and, um, for me, it's I just never did that. But I remember the after hour party uh, on Ross Festa several nights, uh, and seeing several of the audience members like at six in the morning passed out in in the hallways of the hotel and all like that. Like going, um, okay, you know, I stayed up until you know sunrise and and I'm. Um, I'm not tired because the for me the concert amp, amp, amped me up and gave me so much energy that I couldn't fall asleep. <laughs> you know, because I was just so you know going to a concert, you know, especially these kind that are very intimate in a way. It takes you to a, a level that you know I, I didn't feel when I went to like big arena concerts. Mm -hmm. you know seeing you know bands like metallica or queens right you know mm -hmm. i didn't get that feeling you know and it's like with the with the smaller prog, the prog fest mm -hmm. that feeling because it's like instead of me being you know on the a little speck up in the uh in the bleachers i was right close to seeing a lot of the bands you know you know iq mm -hmm. um you know, and then, you know, when Martin played with John Wetton, you know, and uh, so it was, it was just a great feeling. Mm -hmm. And I do miss that. I, you know, I do want to eventually go back down to uh, Ross Fest or if some, if someone puts something on in between the, you know, the distance, you know, I like, you know, it's just, unfortunately, uh, things in the past six years have kind of gotten in the way, uh, financially and, uh, and health-wise. So it's like, I, I have to kind of stay put until things, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, keeping my fingers crossed because I've got, um, I got a couple of things, uh, Tests that I need to take in order to qualify myself for a new kidney. So I'm keeping my. Hang on a minute. You haven't drunk. You haven't smoked. You haven't done recreational drugs, and you got kidney problems. That's not fair. <laughs> no, it, it really. I I I can't. You know, I I never figured out what's going on. The only thing that someone said is it had to be with genetics. Something that your mother had. Something that your father had in their DNA when they kept. When they conceived me, something happened, and it didn't happen until my thirties. Wow, you know. But mm. I keep. Uh, I got a lot of friends that they say, with all the stuff that you've gone through in the past six years, you have got to be the most optimistic 
happy person <laughs> I've ever met. And I said, what's the alternative? Mm. The alternative is sulking in the corner. And I can, and that, that's not going to make it better. Mm. I think it's going to make it worse. Mm. And, and the, the great thing for me that has really lifted me and helped me is music. <laughs> I'm constantly listening to music, you know, whether it's in my car or on my tablet or on a computer, wherever it is, I'm listening to it. I'm always listening to it. And it's really kept me, lifted me up from a place that I could have gone. And that's that's the fantastic thing about music is it, it, um, has a healing power. Mm. Oh yeah, um, and especially when you can connect with the, the music, and you feel you know feel it going through you. You know, like with you know with IQ and then Frost. You know those two. Yeah, I mean I had that feeling, and then you know our mail system in in the United States sucks. Mm. It has sucked quite a few years, um, things that come from short distances that usually are supposed to be here like in two two days have taken weeks. Yeah. Um, I've, ha- I've mentioned, I didn't mention who I got, the, I was getting the CD from, but I said that someone sent it on the, four, I think it was the 14th or the 10th of April and it still hasn't shown up. Mm-hmm. And someone said, I've had it where I got some from the UK in a week's time and sometimes in months time. It's really depends on who, you know, the customs, you know, is one thing, you know, oh, and, it, and it's like, uh, so I'm really, I'm look, really looking forward to when, when the rain season, you know, shows up <laughs> because <laughs> The, the three tracks that I heard right there, it was like going, if that's any indication that well, I know that I'm going to love the whole album. Well, you bought it. Oh, you got it on its way. So you should listen to it on Spotify at least so you get a chance to hear it. Well, you know, do it, do it. <laughs> or Bandcamp, you know, it's up there as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing. A lot of a lot of uh, the bands that I've talked to that uh, that they love Bandcamp. Mm-hmm. Because Bandcamp is on the band's side, they're 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 not there to gouge gouge you know you financially. They're there to help you get your music out, and, and I love how it it allows you to stream it, or you can buy it. You know, if it's only digital. Uh, for me, I prefer. You know the CD physical media. Oh yeah. You know, um, I do understand when people get uh, digital. You know, if they don't have the room for everything, but I know you can put your music up on the cloud. But I always have this fear that something could happen and it it vanishes. (laughs) And then if you paid for it. It's gone. Mm-hmm. At least here, this is my backup. It's, I put this on my computer, and um, this is how I how I listen to it in in my car. Mm-hmm. I put I put everything you know whatever I want to listen to in there, so I can listen to it in the car. And um, and if something happens to my computer, I got all the music right here. You know, yeah. But I have to. I have to re-put it back into the computer, but, you know. Absolutely. But also, too, you know, like you say, in Spotify, even though that they, they're they not, they're almost anti-band, you know, they they don't pay you guys, you know. Mm. And, uh, but then you get, uh, what's it, Amazon, they have the Amazon Music. When you, when you buy a CD, uh, most of the times they give you mp3 file that you can play on their app yeah so it's like you know that's cool um a lot of times the streaming stuff i only use it 
not as a replacement for buying a CD. I use it as my way to sample the, C the CD. And if I like it, then I go and buy it. You know, I, I, I'm one of these people. I refuse to have, uh, buy something digitally. I'd rather buy, you know, physical media. Uh, unfortunately, there's very few instances where bands, that's all they do because, you know, for a small band, it's hard to uh, print up the CDs and everything, you know. One of my friends' band, he he found in his uh, in his closet, all the way at the bottom, a uh, case of a hundred of his CDs that from his first album in 1993, mm -hmm. or somewhere in that area. And he goes, they're sitting here and they're collecting dust. So I'm, you know, he said I'm only putting out any future music. Digitally, because it's it gets out there quicker to the people, and I, you know, so I understand his uh, his mentality over it. You know that it's not going to be economically feasible for him to print up a CD. But then, when you get behind band, uh, labels like uh, GEP or Inside Out Music, you know. That's that's a different story. They you know they put out the albums for you know and you know like you said you know GEP is a pretty you know they're a strong album they're record label for especially you know they're putting out all their own you know all IQ stuff so you know they got full control and that's that's what you know I think that's I think that's a band's dream come true, you know, to be in full control, you know, from, from the creation of the song to the printed CD, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's like, I, what I've owned that you're on, you know, I really enjoy it. I, I remember um, I misplaced it when that uh, project a few years back, Neo. Oh yeah. Um, I had they. Um, I think it was that that um, that label. Um, but they sent out um, the promos of it, and it was just no case. It was the, the insert folded up, the disc inside of there. You know, just. You know, obviously, it's save on postage. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, when I listened to that, I, I was like, now this is cool. You know, it's like a, a, a neo prog uh, super group, mm -hmm. you know, playing all the, all the hits and, and just hearing the different singers' uh, interpretation of the different songs. So, um, well, I mean, Neo was really interesting because uh, it came about. Um, after Andy joined IQ. Uh, and it was always a huge bugbear to me that IQ played so few gigs. You know, if we got into double figures in a year, it was going some. We did a two week tour in, I think it was 92. And that was the longest tour we ever did, you know. And I just thought, oh, I was, you know, live to gig and I can't gig. And that's why I played with all these other bands because I wanted to gig, you know. And uh, Neo, uh, we actually played a show uh, in the States, must have been Neo Fest, two, whenever it was, 2004, I, I, I don't know. But anyway, um, and I sat there with Andy and Lowell and Rob Aubrey and said, oh, wouldn't it be great to do more of this? This is so good, it's brilliant. And, and I think it was Lowell said, well, you know, why don't you get people together who want to do it? And so, we became our own tribute band. Uh, got in touch with you know people like Clive and um, uh, Nick Barrett and, and Alan, and, and you know it was great because there was no real egos there. It was you know oh you know, Nick loved Outer Limits by IQ. He said oh, I really want to do that, you know, and so we did. And we did it a bit different. We did a bit of reggae in there, which you know would never have gone across uh, well. 
um, and we did a, an instrumental version of the Enemy Smacks, you know, and, and why not? Why not do some things like that, you know? And, right. and it was and the plan was to do more, but of course the problem is that you've got people from different bands, all of these different schedules get in the way. And uh, so it was never to be, you know, Peter Banks, uh, who I played with uh, from, from Yes with uh, uh, Steve Christie, was due to come out to do a show, but didn't uh, happen. And uh, that's another story. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, Cole Palmer, we were talking to at one point. So there was lots of opportunities, but it was just not feasible because there was it was too busy to do other things. So we only ever did two shows, but, you know, it, it, I put some photos of recently, a guy called Marcin, who's from Poland, but now lives in the States, uh, sent me some photos and we put those up. And got a great response from people. They really enjoyed those shows because again it's, it's not about the big i am it's about the music you know that's that's one of the things you know when i notice with, with modern progressive rock it's like no, there's not many egos i mean if there is that it's very you know far and few between you know um i mean there the, it's like it's basically the audience and the band are on the same level, you know. They're there, there are all egos. It's just you don't get to meet those people, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're, they're the ones you don't get to meet, <laughs> right? Right. Uh, so it's like you know, I, I mean, I, I, I would hope um, down the line that um, when I'm able to get back to you know, going to shows that um, one of the shows that, you know, is rain for if it's anything that you do, you know, if you're involved with another project or filling in for someone, you know, things, well, I you mean, know. We are hoping to come over. Of course, we'd love to come over with Ross List again. That'd be fantastic. It's been, oh, so. yeah. Uh, well, that but, would be the perfect place for your music, you know. But, you know, um, um, who knows? Uh, uh, it, it, just see what comes along. One of the great things about the last 12 months is the lockdown has meant recording with loads of people uh, that I would never have expected. I finally had to learn how to use uh, Logic, you know, which is a software for recording with uh, after all this time. And I recorded all my bass parts for the Rain album myself. And it was so freeing. It was uh, gave me that opportunity. Um, so often in the past, I've been in the studio, I've got an idea and there hasn't been time or there's been pressure or people have got other ideas. But this time I could put down my whole idea, the whole construct. And, uh, you know, so people could see where it was going and how it was leading. You know, for instance, Subterranea, when I did the bass part of Subterranea, the track, um, people weren't sure about that. They really weren't sure. And I said, well, let, just let me do it. Just let me record the, the, the idea. And then see what you think was sort of recording the whole thing rather than just listening to you know two bars and saying you don't like it. And of course, that's I think that's a really strong part of that track now. And there's been uh, Arena, there was a, a track on Visitor, uh, and the producer there said, Is that part good? I said, Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, then, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah, well, one uh, one person that I uh interviewed a few weeks back, uh, Robert Perry. You know, he was involved in that group three. Yeah, yeah. And um, I like that. he album. was telling, and uh, he carried on uh, after, you know, Keith Emerson passed. Uh, he, he did, instead of doing three, he called it 3.2. Mm. And he did two albums with that. And the last album that he did, he. He said, during the lockdown, he says, I got, like yourself, got to learn how to record everything himself, not an engineer it and everything. So it was like, he did all the instruments and um, he said, people that didn't use that time to learn something uh, wasted that time. You know, because, um, and I can understand it's like learning and doing something new that you never thought you were going to do before. 
Mm -hmm. um, my friend does a similar show and he's, he just celebrated a year of doing that. And I started it mine in November. And, but I don't think if we had the lockdown, I don't think I would have done it. So it's like, it was opportunities that, you know, through a, a dark time, you know, opportunities arise and you're able to, you know, do things, you know, musicians in the studio and uh, fans, whether they do something like this or, or a printed, you know, uh, magazine or, you know, on their own websites or something like that, you know, they learn to do something different and new. Yeah, and, there are always consolations. That's the thing to look for. I mean, the bad thing for, for you guys is that you're, or you couldn't go, you couldn't play at all. Yeah, no. but, but I mean, I don't think we'd have done the album, or the Rain album, if it hadn't been for the lockdown. You know, it was, we, we started, uh, Rob, uh, Groker, Andy and me, uh, wrote a load of stuff uh, the year before. And the original idea, because uh, Andy and myself were playing it as well in a local Birmingham band called Quilt. And Quill had been around for years, you know, it's one of those bands in, in the Midlands in, in, in Britain where if you say you're in Quill, oh, no, I used to know Quill from you, I was 1980 or whatever. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the drummer with Quill is Bev Bevan now. So we've got two drummers, Bev Bevan from ELO, you know, and uh, so of course that helps the notoriety. And the original idea, Quill weren't doing much. And Andy said, well, to, to, to Bev and Joy, the singer, let's do a prog album. And that was going to be called Rain, R E I G N. And that right. never came to anything because, you know, prog is, is a thing. It's, it's, you know, got, you have to do it in a particular way. And, and it, it just didn't gel. So Andy and myself and Robert had written a load of stuff. And that came together in the lockdown. You know, uh, I was talking about it. And, and, and Andy said, I've uh, got the perfect guitarist, Mirren. Uh, and, Okay, great. I'd met Mirren uh, before he was in a band called Hey Jester, who supported Tim Bowness uh, in uh, 2019. And it's stunning. Honestly, the guy is 24, 25, and he's, he can sing, he can play like you can't believe. And it's like, hello, hello. So, you know, yeah. and you've got this perfect combination with the band. Uh, I think it's a really good rhythm section. You've got two great singers in Mirror and, uh, and Rob. Rob is a, a lovely songwriter. His dad, Rob, Rob Groker, his dad was Kelly Groker, who's in ALO as well. And, and Rob has got that whole songwriting thing going down. Pat, Andy Edwards drips music. If you said to Andy, write me an album before the weekend, he would do it. And it would be a great album. He, you know, he, he, he can just, he, and it's him and Rob and Mirror are so technical proficient and you got uh, Mirren is a great guitarist and it's all these combinations of things and things have come up we've just said yes let's do it and there's no egos there it's a case of yeah we can make that work and, and it's been an absolute joy uh, and so yeah it wouldn't have happened but for the lockdown so the, the key now is uh, we're working on the next album aiming to get that out before the end of the year we've got about eight songs that we're working on we've got some gigs lined up so we can actually get out and make a noise and we actually played together now because of course you know we did the album we'd never actually played together uh, uh um but now that's happened and we think yeah actually this could work <laughs> but again it's like you were saying earlier that we're not playing the songs the same way as we play them on the album they're going to be different and we're, you know for particular gigs we're going to throw things in that you wouldn't expect as well which again is fun and it's those sorts of things that people think hello yeah, I like that that one, the lockdown video, you know, where everybody has their own little square. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, Devils Will Rain. That was uh, our first attempt at doing anything in the start of the lockdown. And Devils was the first track we, we wrote together. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that was one where you thought, there's, there's something in this. And uh, Dandelion, which was the video, um, we needed another track. Uh, and basically Andy said, Oh, I've got this song, what do you think? It's fantastic. So, you know, we worked on that and we made it into a, a rain rain song. And uh, um, 
yeah, it, it, it's just a great band. It's one of those bands. Uh, it, it, I remember uh, Frost, when I joined Frost, uh, uh, you know, I heard the demos and thought, this is fantastic. It reminded me of Dream Theatre, hearing uh, images and words for the first time in Belgium with right. James, and thinking, this is brilliant. And who is it? I'm going to go and buy it now. And, you know, Frost was like that. Uh, and I was so pleased to be on uh, Million Town and part of that whole band at that time. And the same with Rain. Rain has that same thing for me now. It makes me think, I'm so lucky to be part of this. I'm right. a very lucky boy. <laughs> and, it, you know, like I said, those three songs, uh, if, like I, if that was any indication of what the whole album is like, you know, the rest, I'm gonna... the rest is absolutely rubbish, Ron. It's, you just got the best one. <laughs> that could have been the mini album. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it's like I've seen a lot of uh, music, you know, amazing music coming out of the lockdown. I've heard bands that they basically halted, you know, especially in the United States uh, when it started with us in mid March when it was everything started closing down, you know, and it's like. And they're putting everything on hold, and it's like uh, I can understand, but there's other bands that don't live in the same city that are creating their music. So it's like obviously something happened with certain bands that they just decide, you know, we're put, you know, putting everything on hold until you know we get the the okay to come out of our shells you know? mm. and and then you know bands like you rain um uh i'm not sure if you heard of them the the licorice quartet uh is some members from a band called jellyfish uh, from the 90s uh they 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 put out something in 2020 and then just recently um band that I'm going to be interviewing next month, Evershire. Mm -hmm. They're putting out two albums this year. They, it's, the first one's coming out, and then later in the year, the second part to it, you know, so it's like it's, right now with the lockdown, it's the, the age of music, you know, creating, you know, where you guys are given the opportunity you know, you don't have any other, you know, the distractions that you had before, they're not there anymore because you're, you're, you're stuck in your house mm -hmm. pretty much. So it's like, you're a musician, you know, make music. I'm a fan, buy music. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, uh, I'll miss going to see gigs as well, you know, uh, and um, one of the things about um, getting into house and techno and things like that is it gives me a similar feel to being in a crowd, a crowd at a prog gig, you know, because people are there because they love the music and they want to have a good time and enjoy it. Uh, and, you know, some of the best experiences, we went over to uh, Holland, uh, gosh, 2019, uh, um, to see a uh, band called System 7, which is Steve Hillage out of uh, Gong. Right. And he's, he's now got a, a, him and Miquette doing a, um, house techno sort of stuff. And Mike from IQ was going to be DJing beforehand because Mike used to be a DJ in London. Right. Uh, and Mike was ill, so he couldn't do it. But we had such a great time. You know, and it was basically loads of prog people there dancing <laughs> and enjoying themselves. And, you know, right. it, 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 a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Yeah, in, in this past year, you know, um, you know, watching people on, on Facebook, you know, they're posting music that they like and talking about it. I think in 2020, people were talking about music more than they were previous years because they had nothing, no time, you know, time was there, you know, that. They had time on their hands so it's like you know talk about music and i think i bought uh music bands that i never never thought that i would be interested in you know uh 
recently I got um, a few albums from the tubes. Oh yeah, tubes are great. And and I missed it the first time around. I'm listening to this album, these albums, and I'm like going, why didn't I listen to them when they first came out? Um, we used to play white punks on dope with IQ. Yeah, that's that's a. I've been watching those videos of the uh, early videos of the tubes where it comes out with a what is it like that twelve inch or two feet tall uh, platform shoes. <laughs> Yeah, and his cock hanging out. Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. And it's like, she's <laughs> my girl. My girlfriend saw that, and she goes, "What the hell is that?" And I'm like, going, "I didn't even notice that. I just was watching the guy, you know, barely standing up because of those platform shoes, and then falling over, you know, into the, you know, his stage, the stage hands, you know. But it's like." <laughs> One of the first IQ gigs that I did was uh, a memorial gig for Les Marshall, who uh, um, was bass player between Tim Esau and me. Uh, and, and Tim, uh, sorry, uh, Les uh, died, uh, well, suicide actually. And so we did a gig to make some money for a memorial for him. And uh, it wasn't very serious. We started off with Watcher of the Skies, IQ playing Watcher of the Skies, and uh, we did uh, White Punks, and we did loads of Jadis were there as well, and we played Big Bottom by Spinal Tap. But I always remember we did, uh, with IQ, impromptu, we did uh, Sweet Transvestite from uh, uh, Rocky Horror Show. Right. Uh, and, it's, and I had never played it before, so I'm going over to Mars saying, what key is it, what key is it? So it's, okay, so I'm playing it, come on. Uh, and uh, uh, get to, to the middle bit, you know, where uh, um, Brent goes, so, and, and of course it's come up to the lab and, and Pete went, so, and then he couldn't think what the next line was and he ran back to Martin and said, what's the next line, what's the next line? <laughs> I said, come up to the lab, come up to the lab <laughs> and see what's on the slab. <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was very, very much, there is a video of that around somewhere and one day somebody should release that properly because it's ridiculous. I'm dressed as a nun. I, Mike is dressing in uh, sparkly hot pants, or I seem to recall, with uh, these glasses with spikes on. It was all a bit rock wild. And I remember Pete's bat wings for Watch Through the Skies were made from a cornflake. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember hearing and, or reading more like it is, you know, the, the in, famous or infamous uh, IQ Christmas shows, you know. Oh, where, yeah. You know, and it's like, Oh, the, you know, it's like all those. I'm like going. I wish I had money that I could fly over for those things. You know, it's like, it's like, it's. I mean, you guys were just having a lot of fun. You know, oh, yeah. you're doing your you're doing your songs and doing cover songs. And I, I heard um, at the that San Jose show in '94 that. Uh, when you guys were doing some cover songs, you were doing stuff that weren't prog, and and you were, I think, you were upsetting some of the audience members because they were, they weren't expecting that. I think someone, I think my friend said that you guys played a Madonna song, and they went, and they <laughs> they went, oh my god, why are you, why are they doing this? You know, and it's like, hey, it's fun, you know. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it, 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 it's absolute bull. I mean, if you say, okay, let's play a yes song, let's play Wondrous Stories. Is that a prog song? No, it's not. It's a pop song. You know, so okay. what does it matter? And if people are having a good time, if, if you take it too seriously, you're po-faced about it, and you want to disappear up your own backside, then IQ isn't the band for you, you know, right. because even the serious songs, People can be messing about, you know, people can be having a laugh. We used to, we used to do that on stage and, you know, bugger about while we're playing. And it, and why? Because it's fun and it makes people laugh. And that's what I'd want to see if I was on the other right. side. No, you you want to see a, a fun, you want to see a fun show. You know, you want to, when you go home, you go and say, you know, I saw this band and they play great music, but they were having fun on stage. They were, you know, Doing things that I would probably do, you know, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, 
you know, speaking of un unusual cover songs, it's like uh, Marillion doing a Britney Spears song. Mm -hmm. They did Toxic, and they did, but they reworked it that it made it was a, a Marillion song, and that's mm -hmm. that was kind of that's kind of cool, you know. You know, as I'm getting older, I'm appreciating more genres. Um, and, you know, sometimes genres that I would have kind of gone, eh, you know, I, no thank you. But I'm just, you know, that's you know. The you, problem. That, that's the problem people do. They're, they're you know, they, oh, it, it's that type of music, therefore I'm not allowed to like it. Right. Well, it's your problem. You know, it, it's music. There are two types of music. There's good and bad. And exactly. what is good to you and what is bad to you is is what you like. It's not doesn't have to, I mean, what one of the best experiences I, I to, um, Alex again said uh, a band called Leftfield were playing in Birmingham. Uh, oh, I was going. I never heard of them. Never heard of them. Okay, I'll give it a go. It was transformational. It was absolutely. They played uh, this one album, Leftism, from start to finish, and I was like. It was just so much fun. It was, it was brilliant. And it made me, you know, that was my opening into a whole wider world of music. We, we played a, a, a Christmas show with IQ back in 2006 or something. And uh, they haven't got any CDs. Uh, and I said, well, I've got, I've got Faithless, you know, dance in the car. Mike said, let's suck it on, you know. So we, we had a, you know, a, a, a Faithless CD on for IQ. And that's what we do. If you don't like it, don't stay. It's okay. But you know, this is what IQ is. This is right. what we do. And you've only got to look at the the stuff that the band has done throughout his career. In terms of that, it's, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that IQ play songs that they like. One of the best covers we ever did was "Quiet" by Björk. Do 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 do. do. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, when you go back further into IQ's catalog, you know, you know, like you were saying, that they're having fun is like the, the reggae uh, song Barbell is in. You know, you have those things. And um, Wait, the so, side four of uh, Nine in the Pond, you know, you listen to the tracks on that, Flack and thing. The, the, one of the, the first uh, uh, IQ songs I heard, I didn't realize who it was. And, um, Melody Maker, I used to buy, it was a, a British paper, and they used to have a flexi disc on the front. And I kept this flexi disc because there was a band called Reflex on it, and they had a song called uh, uh, Praying to the Beat. Praying to the Beat. Uh, and I quite like that. And IQ were on the flexi disc as well, doing a song called Beef in Box. And it's like a funk song. And Mike told me the story that, well, I think it was Lawrence told me the story that Mike used to have a, 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 a budgie called One Shoe. And uh, but one shoe used to make a lot of decisions for the band. You know, the budgies can either be very sort of prim or they get very fluffed up. Uh, it's a case of, you know, uh, that's when they're happy. And very trim means that they're, they're not happy. So the question asked to one shoe was, should we be a prog band or a funk band? And the answer came back, you should be a prog band. So it's all down to a budgie. That's the only reason why IQ is a prog band. Could have been a funk band, you know. They went with you, <laughs> probably about <made> thousands. <laughs> <laughs> it been been a you know different stuff came out, you know. Who, who knows? You know, yeah. it's I I I think, and um, and I've seen a lot of it. Is like there's two types of bands out there. There's the band that wants to have fun doing what they're doing. Or there's a band that their primary goal is to make as many hit singles as possible. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what the quality is, as long as it sells, you know, and I don't, you know, you know, a lot of the, some of those big bands, you know, you know, they have uh, musicians or their singers that, you know, it, the pressure gets too much to them, you know, and, you know, and they commit suicide because it's just, it's no longer fun. You know, it's getting to the point where it's just like a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. And, and, 
and that's what I, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that are in bands and they don't look at it as a nine to five job. They look at it as something fun to do. You know, they're serious about it, you know, to create all the music, but when they're finished with it, they're happy that they did it. Mm -hmm. They're not like, oh, here's another obligation. Mm -hmm. Put out an album, you know, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole point about prog to my mind, you're not going to make any money out of it. So you might as well be enjoying yourself and having a good time. And anyway, creating something that's worthwhile, but getting people to enjoy it. When we go out with uh, Rain, as I said, we've already discussed this, that we are going to make it fun. We're going to make it different. You're not going to just hear the album. You're going to hear the tracks, but you're going to hear them differently. And you're going to hear stuff you don't expect. And that's what you want in it. You know, if, if you're going to see a band and you think they've only done one album, or oh, oh, we know what we're going to get. Well, you, you kind of know what you're going to get with Rain, but you're going to have a few surprises. Yeah, it's like, you know, I, I, I look forward to hearing the rest of the album. And I, you know, you know, like I said before, everything that you've done, you know, it comes out, you know, all over the work, you know. Um, and, and to be able to have seen, seen you uh, play with IQ Live, you know, that was amazing. The first time I didn't really know anything you know, IQ. All I knew is I I saw the the energy that was coming off of you guys, and mm -hmm. and I had a great time, and that prompted me to go and purchase as many of the CDs that were available in the United mm -hmm. States, and um, and always hearing about you know like the interesting cover songs or the uh, <laughs> the, B, the B sides. I always think that those those are sometimes those are more interesting because you you know just you get a little more insight into the to the band and what they're all about you know that it's not you know because I think I remember Martin was telling me how at the time most of uh, the guys were at different interest outside of the band you know martin was more into classical music um, and trying you know uh, mike was more dj you know dance music thing um i forget i think was it uh cookie was kind of into jazz I think it was i think if i recall you know you know 93 so so, but it, everybody had a different interest, but all those different parts come together and becomes IQ. Mm, that's it. And, and that's, that's what, you know, you don't learn that from bands, you know, the big bands that are, you know, selling out, you know, in both ways. It's selling out the arenas and selling out their souls you know, for the hit single, you know, it's like, oh, we gotta have a hit single, you know, and it's like, hey, it's nice if you do, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, Martin's view is always with uh, um, Mum's Armo and Are You Sissing, that that's what it was about, that they wanted the hit single, you know, I'm sure they'd have taken it if they could have got it, but the, the problem you have as a, as a, a prog band is if you uh, move from a, a prog situation to a pop situation is you alienate your own audience and all the pop fans think oh we don't like them because it's not cool so it, you know you have to be uh, very uh, lucky genesis was the obvious example of a band that managed to uh, cross that commercial link and i do right. tend to wonder with that if phil collins hadn't done it first if they'd have been able to right and then also too um one of the stories that Robert Berry was saying that how three basically, you know, it was a one and done uh, situation was that, you know, Keith Emerson's um, colleagues, you know, John Wetton and uh, Steve Howe and Carl Palmer uh, became Asia. So they got into the mainstream and um, 
uh, Yes got into the mainstream. You know, a lot of those bands, got, in Genesis got into the mainstream, but, you know, Emerson, I think people put him on a pedestal that, you know, how dare he go mainstream? And, and it, that was one of the reasons why that band broke up because that situation and but but then when you go back and listen to that album you know three to the power of that's a great album you know and it's like but it, it came out 1988 where every all the prog bands were switching to a more mainstream commercial sound and you know some of them worked, some of them didn't. And unfortunately, that was one that didn't. But it was, um, it's really just play, you know, play the music that comes out of you naturally, you know. You know, fight, you know, if you're on a big label, fight with the label, you know, this is what we want, you know, that's it. You know, we're, we're not gonna buckle down you know, and if we happen to write a hit song, then that's a plus. But this is what we're doing. And we gotta stay and then also like you say, stay true to the fans. Don't change things so drastically that the fans are gonna be like going, What did you do? You know? I, 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 I think you have to do the music you believe in. You know, because it's again it's the same point. <laughs> The, the audience, you know, it, it's a big audience, but it's small compared to audiences for other types of music and other bands, you know. And if you don't play the music you believe in, it shows. It, it, it shows. Uh, and, you know, if you come out with something and you think this is fantastic and the rest of the world hates it, well, at least you like it. If you, if you come out with a, a, an album and the rest of the world likes it and you really don't like it, Okay, well, who's who's really the you know guy who's got the problem there? I I, I would hate to have to go out every night. I'll tell you, you know, for instance, um, one one of the things, one of the reasons why I left IQ was to play other music, to do other situations, not to to keep on that same treadmill. Just to you know, there's loads of reasons, but that was one of them. And I played with Heap. I played with Arena again, which is a similar sort of thing. I played with pub bands. I played theatre shows. You know, I did a whole range of stuff and it was brilliant. Um, and it was, a you know, the, the, the theatre shows, for example, I did a tour playing Neil Diamond songs. Oh, wow. And, and it, it, you know, part of you thinks, oh, and then part of you thinks, just enjoy it. You're on stage, you're having a good time. You know, you, you are putting a show over for people, just enjoy it. And I did, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I thoroughly enjoyed working the band because, I, you know, I, I sort of, emceed the band and I was making sure that they were on the money for the show. It was great fun, you know, so you've got to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, don't do it because you're not going to make a fortune out of it, <laughs> whatever you do. Right, right. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of neat, you know, I, I remember there was a time it was you and Clive were doing so many different projects. I think you guys were like the two uh, two busiest guys in Prague. You know, you had your your hands in in different projects. You know, and it's like, and a friend of mine was like, going, well, "Why? Why is he? Why are they doing that?" And as oh, well, you know, to me, it's like I understood after a while. It's like, you know, you do you do one CD and then you um, of a band and then you just wait. And wait, oh, you're putting on I think a I wig there on. You put your hair on. Yeah, I got. No. There you go. You put one on. I'll put one on. <laughs> We've both been the same. Yeah. yeah, you know, this is. Uh, <laughs> you went the opposite way. You had nothing and then you have something. <laughs> you know, it's, it's got to be different as well. Yeah, you know that's 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 what you should have worn when you were in uh, Uriah Heap. That would have actually gone down the storm. That I thought I was burning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. So I that's what you know. 
I, I like about musicians that do different things is like you get to hear different sides of that. I mean, the thing, you thing, know? The thing with that, if uh, any of those bands that have been a, a, a full on thing, I'd have done that full on, you know, as, as I say, um, you know, IQ, I love them to bits, but they release an album every four years. They play maximum 10 shows a year. I've got plenty of time. You know, I'm a guy used to playing 70 shows a year and then working every night on music. So I want to be doing stuff. I want to be going out and, you know, even if it's, you know, much smaller gigs or to no audience, I want to go out and play. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, that's what happened. And I got loads of offers. I played with so many great people. And Damien, oh, wow. Damien from uh, uh, um, uh, Damien Shulman, you know, know that name, Shulman. Oh. And it, Damien was fantastic. And I only wish we'd done more because uh, the, uh, Cookie and myself did, uh, I think, three or four tracks with him for an album called Flags. And they were tremendous, really, really good. Yeah, you know, because with IQ, it's like, I always, you know, like you're saying, every four or so years, and it's like, I was, you, you know, the album gets released, and then you guys tour primarily the UK and Europe, European dates, and maybe an occasional uh, date over here in the States, and then just disappear, and then you, you start to, you know, there was a few times I was wondering, are they still together? <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't until you know where the internet is getting up on full speed that you know you you heard things so you knew that no they are together it's just their like your the hiatus or the hibernation period mm -hmm. you know if you want and I I can I can honestly understand your you know your point that you want to go and do more and it's like it's like so, you know, that that makes perfect sense. You know, you're a musician, you want to do more stuff. You, you know, you, you play, I mean, you know, it's the, the old Stone story about, you know, I've been in the band 25 years and only done about five years of playing or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, there, there was time there. And let's, you know, it very rarely clashed with anything that the band was doing. Uh, and I, as I say, I, I would have loved it if the band had been out full-time um but it wasn't to be so i had to make it work for me because I, I couldn't have stayed in iq if it was if that's all there had been it, it just wouldn't have worked for me because i've been <laughs> right right yeah you know you 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 want to keep you want to keep busy you know you know and i always knew knew from reading things that you know iq was you know, basically, it was a part-time band. You know? Well, you know, people had jobs, you know. Right. Uh, uh, people had uh, families and people had responsibilities, you know. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. But I wanted to play. <laughs> right. You had that, that bug, that itch to, you know, <laughs> even if you just go up there and just, you know, that, you know <laughs> it's like, okay, I did something. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, whatever it was, just just being out there and performing, uh, um, and, you know, and that's why there's so many different things, so many, uh, you know, if there's an opportunity to play, I would say yes, I wouldn't think twice, I'd just say yes, and then think about it later, how, what it was, and think, oh, <laughs> how am I going to make it work? And right. I still do, I still do, and, and that, but that's led me to so many opportunities. Oh, yeah, you know, you get your name, you get your name out there to different different places you know and you well, you're still gonna be able to do it you're still gonna be able to perform you're still gonna be able to get on with people you're still gonna be able to turn up on time you're good still gonna work all those things you've got to line up but uh you've got to say yes and that's that's a good lesson for life kids and you've got a lot of great music we can we can listen to you know uh, yeah. i think i think of everything that i've heard from you uh, brain is more the most unique sounding because you, I don't you don't do a lot of the prog cliches no, you know we do, we do our, our own cliches <laughs> yeah yeah you, you do what you want to do you know and it's like 
And if it's something that, you know, it, you know, I think also too, Prague, it's about, in a way, kind of like breaking the rules of what you're supposed to do, you know, what you're supposed to sound like, you know, you're supposed to break the rules and creating new things. I mean, in the, in the 90s, there was a ton of the, you know, a friend of mine used to call the clones or the, the retro, where they were trying to sound like, the singers were trying to sound like Peter Gabriel or John Anderson, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and it's like, no, it's like, stop, mm-hmm. sound like yourself. Well, I mean, those, those bands, when they started, they didn't listen to prog bands. They listened to blues and classical and rock, and, and they melded them together. And, you know, that's that's why I think what we're doing is the right thing. You know, we've got that songwriting attitude. We've got funk. We've got beats, you know. And, and you've got three... And I'm not technical when it comes to music, but Andy and Rob and, and Miriam, they can talk, you know keys and all the rest of it for, for ages and, and as I say Andy music drips out of him is astonishing uh, Rob is such a fantastic songwriter his songs are beautiful you know uh, uh, the, the thing with um, Devils for example the way that worked Mirren and Rob are singing different parts on that they each came up with a vocal part for the whole song Andy took them and, and used a part of each. And it just gives that, that feel, you know, you've got uh, Miriam kind of doing the minor sort of part and, and Rob doing the very major parts. And, and, and it's, a, it's a treat. It's actually like, wow, there's all these things and it's just like a jigsaw coming together. Yeah, I liked, I liked how on that song where, you know, the, the two singers, and it's like, it, I, I always find, well, I like in bands where, there's multiple singers because you get um, a more variety of what's going on. And then, like you were saying earlier, you know, uh, got his name, the, the young guy, you know, that he Maroon, yeah. sings, sings and plays guitar, and but he plays guitar like a, a season, a season pro that, you know, yeah. and that was it, yeah, and it's all, I mean, it's always amazing when, uh, especially now nowadays, when younger people are into the, into pro, mm. you know, because you wouldn't expect it because, you know, honestly, I mean, like you were saying with techno music, I mean, techno music is great as a background. Mm. You could dance to it. You're not really paying too much attention to it because, it's the beats that are actually taking control over over your body if you're going to move. There's a whole different program here, or a whole different program. You can, you can. I mean, I mean, um, something like that album, Leftism, that I was talking about, is it's got. I, I think there's progressive elements in it, you know. But it, you can dance to it. Oh, you can dance to it. Well, it can't be prog. Yes, it fucking can. Oh, sorry. Yes, it can. You can. It's the whole thing. It, you know, it, it doesn't. You, you, I don't. You know, you could say dub reggae as progressive because it's about the arrangement. You know, right. what's wrong with that? I don't think you'll ever get a progressive country album. That'd be wrong. That'd be against God and nature. But you know, other than that, I think we're okay. <laughs> well, you know, and the you know the I would say the the modern pop songs. Um. There's, I, I just noticed that a lot of it. Modernization, Rob. The modern pop songs. <laughs> what does that well, mean? Well, yeah. Well, the, the stuff that's coming out now. You know, you you hear. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I hear some of it, and then, but then it's like, I hear the same thing from someone else. It's that they sound very similar. Yeah, there's like no, there's you, no different. Well, you just said you could say that with pro. I mean, I, I can point you the direction of the bands, uh, uh, you know, everything, everything, for example, field music. There's the uh, uh, first field music I, uh, track I ever heard. I thought, they sound like Gentle Giant. You know, it was so out there, it's fantastic. And, yet, you know, Prince liked field music. They're from uh, northeast of England, they're great. Band. 
uh, uh, um, our Dutch uncles were a great band we saw, you know, very proggy in terms of their time signatures and stuff. And um, again, there's good music and bad. That's oh, all yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I do, you know, as I got older, I, I do look at look at music that way more, <laughs> more than I did when in 93, you know, 93, I was focused on certain stuff. And I did, and I did notice that there was a lot of clones, copycats. You know, I mean, there, especially I heard there was a, a few uh, clones of IQ in, in a way. Uh, I heard the most weirdest clone of Marillion was uh, I think it was an Italian band called Black Jester. You know, I guess with Jester, you know, you got to be, that means you're Prague. <laughs> uh, just imagine Marillion and Speed Metal. <laughs> yeah. I was, it was like two different things that I really uh, don't think really worked well. Mm -hmm. And of course, since, you know, and I, I don't, uh, I don't say this in a bad way, but it's like, you know, the vocalist, you know, English is not is not their language, and when you know they're singing the words, you know, so it's like they don't pronounce them in the correct a lot of times in the correct way, so it it sounds odd, you know, and um, the job as well. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like you the '90s were full of I, I'd say full of a lot of clone bands, and I uh, we still kind of see them. Or, or you see bands that clone themselves. Like each album sounds exactly the same as the previous album. It's like, you know, where's the originality? Where's the, you know, some, bring in something a little different, you know? You do get that though, don't you, with all sorts of bands? Um, yeah, and, um, you know, that's why I like bands that have something, something different to offer. And uh, even if it's something that at first I'm not into, you know, it's like give me time, and you know, I'll get into get the into that same mind space that that the band got into when they created that album. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll I'll get into, it. um, but it, it's just amazing. I mean, all the fantastic music that I missed the first time around in the '70s and '80s, and I'm I'm catching up, but. There's absolutely no way I'm going to catch up to everything. You know, I get it as much as I can, you know. Uh, like, you know, I I never owned a Judas Priest album in my life, and I bought a, a box set of theirs, uh -huh. you know. And it's like, you know, it's like, and I, I, I you know, I knew the, the hits that they had in the 80s, and it's like, but I didn't know the other stuff, and I um, or all the other stuff, and I was like, oh, "Wow, I'm glad I invested, you know, money and and t and time into it." And now you're breaking the law. Breaking the law, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know. it, uh, yeah, it's good to try different sorts of music. Yeah, you know, you got there's so much out there, and and I I also love knowing people that are actually creating the music. When so when I get their music, it's like you know, it's like I feel more more of a connection than I would, let's say, like a Jewish priest, you know, <laughs> you know, and that's like you know, you, I I like that stuff. Mm -hmm. You get that connection that you know you normally don't get. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and I think I think in the audience uh, in the uh, for a short period of time, I think he was there. He was asking me how to get to uh, to watch watch the show, and and I go, oh, okay, you know, here you go. I told him where to go, and I even gave him the link in case he wanted to drop by. But you know, he says, oh, I don't want to steal JJ's thunder. <laughs> Oh, he's very welcome to. <laughs> but I, I, I do appreciate, you know, that you took the time to do this, you know. No problem, mate. No problem. I mean, I, it's, 
a good way that we can, after uh, amount of years, you reconnect. You know, I think the last time that, but it was in a busy, busy thing was uh, 2009. You know, at 3RP. You know, but you know, it's, it's nice, nice to be able to. When when I asked and you said yes, you know that I was like going, oh great, you know I was I was honestly I was had a fear of I was going to get an answer that I've gotten from some other uh, unmentionable na names in the business. Uh, that, oh, go through our um, my manager or you know my, the <laughs> label, and I never hear from them ever again. You know some of no, them no. that I. And so when you said yes, I was like going, oh, well, this is going to be, this is going to be great. I've always been a tart, Ron. It's no problem at all. <laughs> Good. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm glad you did it. And, um, and it was really, really nice to reconnect with you again, you know, well, even crazy. though we're, we're so far apart, but, you know, with the, with the internet, we're, we're, we're close as, Absolutely. Well, Ron, I hope to see you again at a show. And I hope when you get the a CD, let me know when you get it. And if you don't oh, get it in a week or so, let me know and I'll make sure you get another one, all right? Okay. Uh, it's been great to see you. But, uh, oh, you too. I need to go yeah. and smoke, uh, drink beer, take hard drugs and have sex with something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll live vicariously through someone else. <laughs> uh, probably, probably. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you again, John. I really do appreciate it. You're great fun, Ron. Take care of yourself and I hope to see you again you too. too. You too. All right. Keep in touch. All right. Cheers, mate. All right. Bye. Cheers.